One of those things that I've learned is that there are problems of scale that don't show up until you scale. And yes, you can do forecasting and you can do load testing and all kinds of stuff. Human beings just work really different to any automated thing out there. And what I found is that sometimes the performance will degrade. So as we've scaled slowly rather than quickly, which is what uh, everybody wants to do, we've learned where the bottlenecks are. But we've learned bottlenecks because we're growing relatively slowly. So much of business opportunity comes down to who other people you can meet, who can open doors for you. Not necessarily Correct. clients, right? but don't look at every opportunity. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Website. It's like, I can sell this to you, right? And I'll find a way to take your money. Firstly, find a way to be useful to them. And then if you do a good job, you get to open the doors. And I think it's a good lesson to any young people listening to this podcast as well. And it's like, don't necessarily go at someone and say, hey, you need to pay me for me to show up. Because they'll look at it and what are your skills? Go in and say, hey, how can I help you? Right? What can I give first? Yeah. And then opportunity comes off the back of that. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of More Clients, Less Effort. I am joined by an incredibly special guest today, Nick Thackerell. Nick, thanks for joining me. Over. No worries. Thank you so much. Gonna, happy to We're going to uh, get into your impressive book collection shortly, but to introduce okay. you, Nick is the founder of Leads Hook, a tool that we use here at Win More Clients as well, but it's an incredible mas- marketing personalization software. Nick helps develop technologies to automate persuasion and digital marketing campaigns. And we're going to drill into that more and more detail as well. Nick ended up with a business where lead generation sales were inconsistent, and this resulted in Leadsook as an internal tool for his own thing, which eventually, by happenstance, happened to overtake the actual product itself. And Leadsook allows users to learn about your markets in real time and prevent the most appropriate message or offer for them to take the next step. Now, amazing, amazing tool. And having done lots of quiz funnels in my time as well, Nick, and to finally stumble across you and Leadshook was a bit of a revelation for me. But before we get there, mate, underground, it's the underground software. It's the underground <laughs> software. It's, it's, you know what? It's, it, it's a software that doesn't get testimonials. We'll get into that. No one wants to share it. But mate, you've got to, you've, you've, you've done this by accident, right? And I want to do that, right? right? Because I know one of the things you talk about persuasion as a trading system that produces winners but your background is actually in mathematical finance and investment management right probably right. like me very much inspired in the 80s by bud fox and gordon gecko yeah i was uh, well in my case wise. it was just I, I i finished uni during a recession and so i was like can someone just please give me a job so <laughs> so it just it just so happened that uh, so it was another accident actually so okay well, how do we get we're in uni we're doing mathematical finance we're doing investment management okay this is a kind of interest for you and yeah. you've got a career incredibly mapped out for you this is the vision in a big bank well no actually actually I did, I, did, like I did accounting and marketing and then when i finished uni there were no jobs and i just i i kind of i sent out about three thousand letters this is a uh, cold prospecting 101 or back in the day when you had to mail things ask, ask enough and, people and, and, some guy, and some guy read that i was from fiji and he grew up in fiji uh, but he's an aussie yeah. guy and so he called, called me he goes hey uh, he from fiji why don't you come in for a chat and so the only reason why he invited me for a chat was because I was from Fiji. So we had a chat and he said, listen, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can help you. So he, there was a, there was a, I, I was very good at spreadsheets. So I could write VBA macros and all kinds of stuff. So there was a job that, that came up uh, at Coca-Cola, right in Circular Key here in Sydney. And so he said, listen, it's a three-day thing. You want to do it? I said, yeah, I'll take anything, man. So I went there and then they said, oh, he's really good at Excel. So then I went to Thomas Cook back then. And so I started moving with all these finance companies. And by the end of six months, I had like like the who's who on my resume. Granted, it was like three days here and two weeks there and five weeks there and all that stuff. But it was enough to get a foothold in, in actually an investment bank that said, okay, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll. He's got a wide array of ex- experience. And then it's it's inside the bank that I that I uh, that I wanted to get th- that I then did a full-time degree and full-time work. That's when I did math, maths and finance while working full-time. Yeah. I find it interesting, like, I think once upon a time, the idea of seeing someone split between jobs a thousand every three days or every three months or something, you'd probably would have said they're not very employable. Yeah. Certainly my father would have said that. My grand, absolutely my great grandfather would have said that as well. It would have been definitely take, take them out of the employment pool because why would you only be at a job for for three months or three days, right? Right. People had jobs for life back in the day. 
But now it doesn't seem to be so much of an issue that someone jumped between jobs for short periods periods of time. So, yeah. Yeah, no, so, so in my case, I guess it was it, it was contractual. So let's in, they did hire me only for three days. So yeah. it, it'd be different, I think, if I was leaving full-time employment every three days, then I'd definitely be unemployable. So, so and what's, what's wrong? <laughs> well, thankfully, the, the recruiter uh, would, would obviously talk you up, right? I mean, that was his job to sell you. And so, so I, I, I rarely ever had any resistance. Uh, in fact, to tell you the truth, I've actually never been through a job interview because it was literally, yeah, just, yeah, because by the time I got to the bank, I had, I had who's who on my resume. And obviously this guy would not have recommended me unless uh, the, the previous uh, three, four day job or whatever, the, the, the short term roles that I was having was actually yeah. generating value. So yeah. I actually ended up in the, in, the, in the guys at the bank said, well, fine, can you just go do this? And that's literally how it started. So I've actually never had a job interview per se. What was the consistent problem that you kept seeing with these organizations? You, you being, you're being brought in to yeah, do yeah. these macros yeah, so, and, and fair yeah. enough, people use maybe one or 2% of Excel's it's, it's, real capability. And what's, what's the I, consistent yeah. problem that keeps coming up? The, the, the issue always, is, always was that they're always working on some new project to transform some area. And and there was never, it was just a lot of activity. And even, even now, like oh. I've, I've got mates of mine in corporate who contact me while we're doing this initiative and that initiative. It's just initiative after initiative after initiative. And most of the time is just chewing up resources with no real outcome. i just tell you a funny story. There's an ASX company that reached out to me. They said, hey, Nick, can you come and help us with our marketing? So I said, oh, cool. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll, it was a CEO. So I, I, I went to the city and I thought it was a meeting with him. And, and little did I know I, they had a boardroom with about 40 people sitting in it. I'm like, what the hell? Maybe I'm in the wrong room or something. He goes, oh, that's my marketing team. And I was like, okay. So we went around the room and I said, okay, so who here comes up with, with the actual, the offer and the, and, the, and the messaging and all that stuff? Like, like who, who made this shitty brochure basically? And no one put up their hand. So then I said, well, what do you guys actually do then? So he went around the room. I said, "No one, no one yeah, like, like, accountability yeah, one for... Kind of give me a one-word summary. What do you guys do?" And literally, the entire forty team was was largely, and not everybody, but but most of them were literally just doing RFPs with different outside service providers. So different agencies. One agency to do AdWords, and then after twelve months, they'd do another RFP, and then they'd get there. And so there was a lot of uh, whining and dining, and and a lot of chewing up of resources. And it made me. So he said, "Can you help?" I said, "I don't think I can because uh, unfortunately." What you need to do is you need to get a CMO that really is is who's built on custom acquisition. Yeah. While the person they had, they had hired was, you know, really, yeah. I mean, they have to be this nice title, but couldn't tell you a bad headline from a good headline. Like the fundamentals were missing. And I said, unless you're willing to kind of get rid of him and hire from someone like from a direct response style training background, it'll be hard for you to, for me to, me to help you guys. So it really never went anywhere. I was kind of honest with the guy. I said, Hey, listen, you know what? I, I don't think this is a good fit. I can't really serve you well because I, I'd, I'd rattle the cage too much. I'd, I'd, I'd piss a lot of people off because it'd be like, well, like, like, what do you do here? I mean, it's a 40 man team and the copywriter was not even one of them. The copywriter sits in the content generation team or some outsourced service provider. And, uh, and yeah, so, so essentially what I, what I found was, was there's a lot of outsourcing of, in, of internal strategy to external service providers, which is, which I, I think is quite dangerous and yeah. quite counterproductive. Is, is, that, because, is that just exist in this corporate enterprise space or do you see that? No, I think it, I think it exists in, in, in a small business as well. I think you mentioned, you just taken on a client in the insurance space and or personal injury or whatever it is. And, and even there, a strategy was largely, largely given to the agency uh, and they did nothing after 15 grand, not even one single lead. Right. So the issue is that I don't think in companies internally have metrics enough to keep someone honest externally. And, and, and at, at first I thought, so I would do consulting work and I would not find any metrics anywhere. I mean, apart from the GA dashboard, which is practically useless. I'm talking about return on invested capital, all that stuff, your, your financial metrics of the business. And so I, I, so I did a course called Finance SOS and about 30, 40 people joined and, and not a single person there was doing it. And I was like, okay, so, and so, so, so I'm, it made me realize that while if you go to LinkedIn, you think like everybody's tracking metrics and everybody's doing attributions and all that other stuff. The reality is that most people are so overwhelmed with the pace of change that we see that never, no one ever gets around to doing the fundamentals. And if you did the fundamentals, you'd very quickly realize that there's a whole lot of stuff in your business you can just call right away and, and, and bring the cash flow back in. So yes, yeah, so in a roundabout long-winded answer, there is very little discipline in business that should be there.
So yeah, they're it's, like it's provided like, services. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting to say that I recorded a podcast earlier this week, actually, we were talking about the difference between growth and scale, right? And yeah. and what what is missing in companies that grow compared to what are the, what are the things that's missing in companies that scale, right? And I'll throw this question to you, to you as well, because I think it's an interesting one, but growth is just sort of getting bigger. It's not necessarily yeah. getting more efficient, which is what something that scale does. And companies that scale and increase their efficiency over time as they become bigger which is hard all largely data driven aren't they correct absolutely yeah i, I don't know anybody that, who's, that client, that, that client yeah. that i've just taken on that you mentioned their previous agency it literally runs stuff for 12 months and the client still does not know why their marketing campaign worked or didn't work still doesn't know why right. they had no, no, so, so my question is no so, so my question is just as a discussion point here why did it take the client 12 months to realize nothing's happening here what, what, what happened to the one week mark the the, the one month mark the the first quarter the second quarter Right. I mean, you would have thought that if I was if you were spending that kind of money, let's say you're building a house and you're spending money, you, 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 you'd want to see something getting built. So that's what I'm talking about is that, that lack of discipline, because if they had metrics in place and well, hang on a second, you guys have built us 10 grand for the work you've done. You've, you've spent 20 grand in ads or whatever. All right. What's actually happened here? Let's jump on a call. Show me how much traffic that drove. Where, where are you tracking all this? How many leads there are? Why are there any leads there? Like you, you, you keep your service provider honest. And, and it's, it's kind of almost like, like unbelievable <laughs> to, to see that it took 12 months for someone to realize that they've blown a bunch of cash and nothing came in return. Yeah. Well, it is. And the promises and placating statements that say, yeah, but we're it's, working it's, on it. It's, it's about to come. This stuff happens everywhere. It's about to come. This stuff happens everywhere. Or, or they're telling them some bullshit about, you know, <laughs> it's, brand, <laughs> it's branding. Branding's like a slush fund, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I think it is that old adage about what gets measured gets managed. And it is yeah. more so now than any time in, in, in the history of, of business. We've yeah. got the ability to measure the effectiveness of a campaign. And even offline campaigns, obviously digital campaigns are very easy to measure, but even offline campaigns, yeah. we can yeah. sort of we can start to get yeah. direct tracking. Yeah, I was in consumer goods before, we would run TV ads, radio ads, all that stuff. Yeah. And while in the online world you can see like oh, I spent a dollar today and I can, you know, what I got to sell, the, the your, your time scale is daily or weekly if you when you're doing online ads such as a tv ad you your, your time scale ends up being like you know a couple of quarters so you'll be like okay well we have an ad campaign that's run from jan feb march well by april we should see an uptick in something so while the, the uptick is not quite directly attributable like like the online marketers enjoy nevertheless you can see that there was an impact or or not mm. and so so yeah i mean j just to kind of like i, I didn't want to want to bash branding because I, I i come from that branding background as well but the point is regardless of what you're doing whether it's branding or not it needs to reflect in some metric somewhere so it maybe it's a visit to your website maybe it's a, more of a social posting about you and that could be that could be people having a, more, a lot more conversations around you maybe people making shareable videos on TikTok or whatever it be there's some measurable outcome that pops in and while it may not be quite as direct as what we have with Facebook ads where I can see my click coming through with the, with, with the uh, with the click ID and I can track that directly all the way to the sale it's not quite as 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 one to one but nevertheless you can see some impact somewhere and well, it's the like lack that. of measurement of that is the great crime here, if you want to call it that. Yeah, um, the, the bombshell there is obviously that if you're going to do a marketing campaign or in any business initiative, really, is knowing what is the what is the metric, what is the needle we're trying to move by doing this, and how can we tell whether we're either on track yeah. or getting there. And, and I think when I, mean, I came out of a project management background, a little bit like you, in that you have acceptable parameters of variation before yeah. you say, no, we're going to stop. Right. We think, yeah. and, and like anything, right? Marketing is a great experiment in many ways. We think yeah. something is going to work and we make educated guesses based on comparative experience. But at a certain point, we need to say, we're going to continue this or we're getting close to the point where we stop doing this because it's, it's outside of acceptable variance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, are you are you moving a couple of standard deviations away from trend line? That's it. That's what you're looking yeah. for. Yeah. 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 Whatever the trend line is. But it's, you're absolutely right. You know, if it's if we're measuring brand, how do we measure the brand? Okay, maybe we mention we look for positive social media mentions. You know, by other people. Correct. Yeah, that's something an influential brand. You might something. Yeah, it, yeah, it's <laughs> not a black hole, <laughs> right? But I think any any initiative has to be looking at what is the acceptable result from this, and at what point do we say no, we're going to draw the line in the sand and not do it, and what point are we going to double down on it as well? Because ultimately, we're still coming back to how can I attract, convert, and keep yeah. clients 
for their maximum value. Yeah, no, I just, so I'll show you an example, right? So I hired an SEO manager about 18 months ago now. And when he came to me and I said to him, I said, I said, listen, we're going after words like lead generation, which, which are hyper, hyper competitive. I don't see any, any traction for 12 months. I said, I'm aware of that. And I said, your job is to, is to keep the cadence going so that we are doing what we're supposed to do on our side. Whether Google rewards us or not, that's largely up to Google. And as long as we're doing what we can on our end, there'll be some traction at some point. But I said, I'm not going to hold you to it, whether you got me ranked on page one or not. I said, it's a hyper competitive space and that should not be what your metric is. I'm going to measure you on how many articles get put out there and or, or essentially the, the actions and activities that show whether we can move the needle. That's it. And around about the nine month mark is when we started seeing traction, right? And so, but I gave him the runway and didn't hold him responsible if the campaign didn't work or not, because that was my problem, not his problem. And, and he said, you know what, for the first time I'm working with someone who, who really is not holding me responsible for that. I said, I said, yeah, I said, because if it was a paid ads campaign, I said, I would hold you responsible. But I said, SEO, this big G, they're the ones who will, who will reward us in due course if mm -hmm. our content is good enough. And I said, and I said, for every guru that's out there, I've, I've heard another guru say the exact opposite thing about SEO. So it's a bit of a black box. I said, so because it's a black box, and I'm assuming if you go to Google, they might even tell you, like, even we even don't know how the whole damn AI thing works. <laughs> We've left it to deep mind. It does what it does, right? And so, so I don't think there's any, any human out there who really knows what's actually going on, except these sort of activities seem to get these types of results. So I said to him, I said, okay, well, if they're the results we're after, then I need you to see these kind of activities. Now <laughs> we can debate on whether activity A is, is better than activity B. I don't really care about that. Just make sure there's some activity going on. And that's it. That's and no. that actually ended up being a very activity. Camp. It very quickly dries I'm sorry? up, isn't it? You're not doing any Correct. marketing activity. Everything else stops. It's the oxygen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and, you know, obviously a big mistake to cut back on your your, uh, your marketing and advertising. If it, if it, if it does. But just on that, Nick, it did make me think of you know, the, the people out there who go, uh, referrals suck, right? And referrals are unpredictable, blah, 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 blah. And what we know for most marketing agencies, particularly, and I suspect professional services in general, right? Referrals account for about eighty percent of people's business, right? Well, <laughs> it's like referrals suck, and you go, "What do you sell? What do you sell advertising?" Referrals, hundred percent of my business. Yeah, like I know you got a product you sh and showed me this product before. How do you go from yeah. contracting, doing really point solution spreadsheet implementations as a gun for hire, if you will, to going, "You yeah, fuck it, I'm going to create my own product." Yeah. Okay. So, so, so at some point, I ended up with a full time job. I was in investment management. I went. I worked in New York as well, and yeah. then I, I, I left. I, I joined a family type of a business. They do consumer products, pharmaceuticals, a whole bunch of stuff. So I went from finance, ended up in, in Fiji. It's a distribution business where one branch was in Fiji. We're based in Australia. This Papua New Guinea selling to about 15, 20 different countries. And, and so I, so when I landed, I said, all right, I want to have a look at the balance sheet and PNL. I got the last 10 years of data. I put it onto a spreadsheet and I started doing some analysis to see what the return on investment capital was and all the, essentially all the financial metrics. And I said, oh, mm. this is pretty crap of our capital along the way on the cost side, as well as on the investment side, like why do we have X million dollars in stock? Do we really need X million dollars in stock? Because I said, well, mm -hmm. where is our bulk of our supplies? And like, oh, they're in Australia. I'm like, okay, well, how often do we get ships from Australia? They're like a oh, weekly. I'm like, okay, well then why do we have 25 months of stock for something that's a week away, right? <laughs> I mean, they, there may be a good reason for it, but like, what is it, right? Then I essentially, I went from department to department, essentially documenting everything. And I realized like they had no systems and processes. It was just, yeah, it was just an uncontrolled mess. So I said, all right, before we can get control, I said, we need data and analytics. So we invested about a million dollars in technology to get on top of all this stuff. We brought everybody onto the same platform and now you can start seeing the data. As soon as we started seeing data, we realized we, have, we, were, we had about, I believe it was about 50 or 60% of more inventory than we actually needed. So we had a, uh, essentially a, a fire sale to get rid of all of that and turn it into cash to start increasing the return on invested capital. So that's kind of like where the finance meets marketing comes into it. And then after a while, it's like, okay, well, let's go launch some brands and stuff. So thankfully there was a guy here there who'd, who'd come in with uh, uh, lots of consumer branding experience. And we launched almost 30 different consumer brands during my time there, which is about seven years or so. And I got to really learn how to like write TV ads, how to formulate products, talk to manufacturers and got the, the view of everything from ideation all the way to a successful launch 
and along the way, a fair share of our own mistakes, including so I wrote TV ads, radio ads, billboards, uh, cinema advertising, like all that offline stuff. Uh, this is pre uh, Google. And so that's kind of like where I got my sense of building products and, and brands and stuff. So I left there uh, and essentially I bought this product out. So I was like, oh, I'll, I'll do some e-com because I've got consumer branding experience. I don't have online experience, but on the side in the evenings, I was doing CPA offers. Basically, I was uh, doing affiliate marketing on the side and not, not as a way to really make money or a side hustle, but more just how does this new medium that. work? Correct. Exactly. It was just to learn. So I would just pick all kinds of offers. There was zip offers, there was sweepstakes, there was all kinds of stuff. And so I was just mucking around with uh, different the CJ.com. There was like all sorts of all the different affiliate networks back then. And really trying to grasp like how, and, and I could see that it was, it was just offline, but at rocket speed, essentially. Like, so you, yeah, like in the offline world, you launch a campaign in January, you, you find out in March or April or May whether they bombed or not. Here, you can find out tomorrow morning whether they bombed or not. So I was like, oh, that's amazing. So it was, it, to me, as someone coming from finance, it was a extremely efficient way to allocate capital. That's what I saw online marketing as. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't so much customer acquisition, all this sort of stuff. I said, wow, this is a, a far superior engine for capital allocation. And so that, that's how I saw it, right? It's essentially like a trading system. And, uh, and, and so then I, I bought this out. I said, okay, well, I know enough about Google Ads and Facebook and all the other stuff. Let me start launching it. And, and because it's a product that works with all kinds of... So when I did the research on this with all the ingredients and stuff, I realized well, whether you have curly hair or straight hair, all that stuff, you would actually... This product applies to you. But how do you run an ad that applies to everybody? So that's when I realized, I said, how happy is your hair? It was my campaign. It was, and it was like a, a, my first quiz. And you would say, what's your natural hair type? And do you have these problems? And do you have, so there was like, describe your natural hair type. So curly and straight and wavy and all that stuff. And the next question was, what, what do you currently struggle with? What, what sort of issues do you have? It's so like, you no know, split ends and all that stuff. And then what would you like it to be? So now we, we, so we're picking the problems. We're picking the desired outcome that you're looking for. And I said, and I the next page was just a, picking up all the answers they gave you and just kind of like doing like almost like a mail merge in real time, just slotting in <laughs> the answers back into a sales page saying uh, brand new product works for people with split ends, blah, 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 who are looking for A, B, C, D. Just doing that, <laughs> sales, sales, sales took off. So, but the problem was that every time you want to make a change, you got to go back to developers and all that stuff. And I said, ah, oh, this really probably should be a tool of some sort. And that r literally resulted in the idea of, of Lee Took being born. And it was made as an internal tool. My, my idea at the time was, I'm just going to go buy up all these broke e-com companies and just shove them through Lee Took, scale it up and sell it. That, that was the original concept. And then uh, someone invited me to some mastermind. I, I went there, I, I kind of showed like an early alpha version of what it was. And about 20, 30 people lined up saying, oh, how do we sign up to this thing? And I was like, I didn't quite realize there was a market for software here. I didn't, you know nothing about software. I didn't run a, a SaaS or anything. So I quickly uh, flew to Dubai and my, got the whole development team there. And we mapped it out in one weekend. And I said to them, I said, well, firstly, do you guys want to do this? I said, I'm not going to do it if you guys aren't interested. And they're like, we got no idea how to do a SaaS product. And I said, well, that makes two of us. But until, <laughs> until three weeks ago, until, until three weeks ago, we, we didn't even know how to, do, how to do quizzes. So let's go, let's dive in. And, uh, and so then they started making a, a kind of like a, a SAST version of what we had originally developed. And, and it just so happened that I, I built an alpha version and the great uh, Dave Jennings contacts me and he said, hey, uh, Michael Gerber just called me from the EMIF. Uh, his next book launch, he wants me to do his book launch for him. He goes, can you do something with, with Lee Took? And I said, done. I said, I'll do, I'll do it for free. I said, I don't know. I said, it's a campaign by bomb. <laughs> provider, provider, you don't get pissed off at me if something goes wrong. I'm in. He said, all right, done. I was looking for kind of subjects, uh, different types of people to apply the product with to see how far we can stretch the product. And so that resulted in us doing a, a campaign where you would answer a bunch of questions and it would tell you what your entrepreneur personality or something of that sort. It was like a, like a radar diagram. And that worked really well. People started sharing it and all sorts of stuff on social media. I mean, largely because I think it was a Gerber brand behind it had, had a lot to do with that. Uh, but regardless, yeah. it worked. He was pretty happy. Dave orchestrated a, a overnight bestseller and yada, yada, yada. Gerber was happy. And now the traffic for that was done by the great Mike Rhodes. So Gerber invites us to, uh, to San Diego. Uh, we get this little nice house on the beach and all this sort of stuff. And uh, Dave Jennings, Mike and I, we hang out with uh, Troy Dean was there for a day or two. And uh, we got to kind of know each other. So like, hey, here's what you're doing. And he was a big traffic guy. And then when he came to Australia, he was coaching some people on how to do online uh, Google ads. So he introduced me to someone and he said, hey, it was uh, Dan Wardrobe. He, he, he introduced me to him. He was looking to build quiz funnels. And I said, listen, I'll build them for free. I said, I can't charge you anyway because I haven't got the billing system set up. 
but you can use it for free. <laughs> so my early days was I need to find anyone who wants to do marketing with, with Chris Funnels or anything, we call them decision trees because you can go in different directions. Yeah. And I was so thankful that I had built it using e -com. We were doing it for lead, classic lead gen, like your solar, that kind of environment. We had a couple of people doing using it in the info space. So my first five or 10 customers or users, I should say, because they weren't even customers because there was nothing to charge them with. The billing system wasn't done was to do all that. And so I would actually jump on Skype calls back then and, and help them construct these campaigns. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm quite thankful for over time that the network or the people that I met along the way were, were kind enough to throw my hat in the ring, so to speak, for me. And I just made sure that I did the right thing by them if they uh, proposed uh, me as a solution that I kind of did my level best to to deliver the outcomes that these guys were looking for what, at, um, at no cost. Yeah. Look, it is, it always is, right? So much of business opportunity comes down to who other people you can meet who can open doors for you. Not necessarily right. clients, right? But don't look at every opportunity. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Say. It's like, I can sell this to you, right? And I'll find a way to take your money, find a way, yeah. firstly, find a way to be useful to them. And then yeah. if you do a good job, you get to open the doors. And I think it's a good lesson to any any young people listening to this this podcast as well. Something I'm trying to teach my son is like, don't necessarily go at someone and say, hey, you need to pay me for me to show up because they'll look at yeah. it and what are your skills? And he's gone, I'm 17 years old. I don't have any, right? Go in and say, hey, how can I help you, right? Yeah. What can I give first? Yeah. Right? And then opportunity comes off the back of that. And I really love that that story, Nick. Yeah. What do you, what sets, sets leads hook apart from, from say, other quiz software? What's, what's so unique about how yeah, you- Yeah, all right. That? Okay, so <clears throat> what's really different is, is that first is designed by, by marketers and it's been designed ground up from all the feedback that we received from the thousands of users now. And, and I still do all the onboarding calls or the onboarding calls are hundred percent done by me. And so I've got, I've got a good thing on the pulse, so to speak, of what the market is looking for, what kind of problems people are trying to solve. And those things go back immediately into product development. So I have a, have a direct line with my head dev. Uh, there's no nobody else that jumps on these calls. I still do those mm -hmm. because I enjoy them. I enjoy meeting the people and seeing what challenges they're facing in their businesses. And so what's really unique is that we've been able to add features that take you to the last mile. So while you can get a WordPress plugin to build you a quiz, it can't do a real-time API call to bring back data from a Google Sheet or your CRM. It can't do mathematical calculations on the fly to do something else. You can't dynamically change, can't make graphs and charts. It, it, there's, there's things that you need to do in real time as someone is giving you answers that educates you that, oh, hang on a second, this guy is my, I mean, something is even as simple as go to the end and have a, a logic conditional node that basically says, well, that the, the way that this person has answered, he's not really my customer. So why don't I just redirect him to an affiliate offer? And you can do that automatically inside the same funnel. So essentially the ability to build this massive maps of behavior and of seeing based on the answers where this person should go. And you can actually customize multiple pathways through the same quiz, which is quite unique in that, I mean, you, you can kind of do it in other platforms, but it visually represented. As a result, you start pulling your hair out. If you have to write if-then statements, we can do it visually. The other thing is that because of the kind of volume that moves through Leadshook, and we cater to those guys who, for whom page speed is like, like really matters, we've optimized for page speeds and we've optimized for, for those things that are no, normally an afterthought. So if you're someone who's just starting the market, you never realize page speed is that important. But when you're spending a million dollars a day or a couple of million a month, it, it, it matters. Because Google will give you like a like a twenty to thirty percent discount just for having better page speed, and it's mm. not that they're giving you a discount; it's it's they they you have better page experience, therefore the, your quality yeah. score is higher, and therefore yeah, and that translates. Want you, want you to Google wants you to use yeah. Google more. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> first and so, first. right now, now if you're spending a mil and you're getting a twenty percent discount, that's that's serious coin. That's that's half a Ferrari or whatever, and you compound it over twelve months. Yeah. So normally when I'm doing a sales conversation, is how much do you spend? I said, well, how would you like another 10 Ferraris this year? And they're like, oh. And so, so, so that, that sounds nice. So immediately it, it translates dollars into, into something uh, quite concrete. And, and that's, that's essentially is, is the sweet spot where we're at while, while most platforms don't go the last mile in the conversion. So for example, we've even got like stuff like uh, if you want to, you can even uh, sprinkle uh, glitter on the page. So let's say you answer a couple of questions. Congratulations, and it kind of sprinkles all this glitter on the page. Um, and so a yeah. little bit of a little bit of fun thrown in there, a little bit of a dopamine hit for for making the right decision. All that stuff you you have a turn into a bit of a celebration because oh. lead gen can be boring, and there there are markets where they so you want to so all those personalization stuff. You can even have a separate. So one of the other 
So this is the this is the for anybody out there. If you are asking for email and phone number on the same on the same form, just split those two up, and you'll get an extra thirty percent more leads just by doing that. So what happens is yeah. you put your name in first name last name email, and you send it to your CRM, and then you ask for the phone number, and you send them to the CRM. There's going to be a whole bunch of people who give the email but not their phone number. Now, if you have your email and phone number and you're on the same form, they'll give you you'll get neither, right? So oh, my, my they, form didn't work, they, but. They, right so now what you can do is then now you can email those people essentially and saying hey listen hey i'm tim i'm just down the road from you good aussie bloke this is not some nigerian scam or whatever click here to give me a phone number and let's chat just doing something as simple as that gets a whole bunch of people who didn't want to give you the phone number up front will gladly like oh yeah okay cool yeah because you've used those two three four five whatever emails to build a bit of a rapport, bit of a relationship, bit of trust, and that gets you that outcome. So I guess in summary, that's like a, a, a number of different things. It's not that we do one thing really different. We do a whole lot of little things that when combined gives you that, that edge. Yeah, I think one of the things that I really like about it is that kind of you can almost model the conversation as if you were there, right? I'm going to ask you a question right. and you're going to respond. And based on your response, I'm going to take that information insert it into my next question, which may be one of five different things, right? right. And I may need yeah. to actually circle back to that question again, right? And yeah. and lead talk is something that allows me to do that, right? So in terms of capability, you should absolutely be commended that it's an incredibly, incredibly powerful tool available for business to, to, to use. And quiz funnels in general, if you haven't looked at quiz funnels in general, it's probably something that could be really powerful for your business at a whole bunch of different places. Not just in terms of lead generation, lead qualification, customer onboarding. Yeah, in, in fact, in fact, we've got someone using it in a call center. Yeah, we've got someone in a call center who's using it because. Yeah. So yeah, so how they use it, and just to show you that it's a framework to think about a decision tree. Where are you, man or woman? Okay, woman, well, different question. Do you have you know these problems? You can, you can, so you build pathways essentially. And so they had a whole bunch of people they had to train for like about thirty days or whatever it was to jump on the calls. And one day the guy said, "Oh well, I'm using it on my lead gen side. Why don't you just put one in my call center and see if you can speed it up." So essentially the, the guy in the call center just clicks the button based on the answer the, the person has given and it gives them the next question. And so rather than having these people sitting in training for six to eight weeks, it brought the training down to like a week or whatever it was. It was a substantial savings yeah, to get people up and nice. running. Right. Yeah. And now what would happen is obviously you have certain pathways that are quite obscure. And unless you've been on in the call center a long time, you wouldn't have seen that question because it really doesn't get asked very often. And so it's those questions that they were able to accommodate quite quickly because they were like, yeah, when someone moves into this pathway, yeah, leads will just display the question that, <laughs> that you're supposed to ask, which, which we don't train you on. Or even if you did train them on, they would forget by the time they got the question because it happened three or four weeks later from when they learned They're like, oh crap, what am I supposed to say here again? And so yeah. this really helped them do that. So that's, that's one example. I've had someone use it in, in, on an iPad in a, in a conference. They had a booth in, in a conference or whatever. And there's just walking people walking around those booths. He would just have his iPad or iPhone. And when they come to the to the thing, they were like, oh, hey. So they would qualify them right there and then. But because they had a dynamically generated uh, lead magnet, they would immediately get emailed. So literally before the guy left the booth, he's like, just check your phone. And he'd be like, wow. And so just that experience ended up wowing them enough to when Monday morning, when they got the call again, like, let's jump on a call. They're like, oh, you're those guys who, who gave me this amazing positive experience because you're able to stand out just through that. Because obviously there's hundreds of booths out there. How do you how do you make yourself known or or, or or memorable? Probably is a better word. Is by wowing them right there and then when they when they come into your booth. It's those simple things. Like most of the time you go, they have a quick conversation with you. They have a big bowl sitting there, fish bowl or something. Saying here you go, <laughs> chuck your business card in here or, or or scan your QR code on your badge that they give you at these conferences. And long gone, you email them on Monday. Like who the hell are you? Yeah. Which one are you? Yeah. So I mean, it's incredible. The use cases. Yeah, it's an incredibly powerful tool, a huge number of use cases. I mean, if you think if even 10 years ago, you'd see them pop up on Facebook fairly regularly in the Facebook feed. It was like, which superhero are you? What's your super what's your superpower? Which which hair which hairstyle is most right for you? Blah, 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 blah. Okay. But it's actually, and I love this from a marketing context because it actually starts to be really value-led. We're not asking for a sale. We're giving value. Right to a, a customer. And I, I love the paid speed one, not just as Google like it, but also encourages completion rate because people get frustrated with quizzes if they don't know how far they're through and right and how many questions you're going to keep asking. But by engaging them in the quiz, by answering, by echoing the their answers back to them, it actually allows yeah. them to, to, to go further. So if you say, well, what's the biggest challenge you're facing right now? And they go, 
lead gen. The next question can be, Nick, how long have you been struggling with lead gen for? Yeah. You know, and then, you know, yeah. and, six and months is a long time, Nick. You know, can yeah, you tell me a condition you, uh, of what you've tried before? I've tried this, this, yeah, this, this. You, okay. Why do you think it yeah. didn't work? Why do you think why didn't work? Right. And it's interesting you say it, and it's interesting you say that, Nick, and I'll put your name back into it. So it's actually in many ways echoing what a really well qualified and well trained sales and marketing kind of rep that intersect between the two would ask someone if they were actually sitting face to face, right? So we're actually creating that diagnostic to then give back to someone in the same way that you go into the doctor and the doctor says, what's wrong? And you go, da, 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 da. Well, I think it could be this. Okay, so, You're actually so, coming so and diagnosing back I'll, and say, well, I'll, now I'll, you want I'll to- I'll extend that idea a little bit further. We've got people right now, because I shared this in the group a couple of weeks ago, they yeah. are building dynamically generated form pages. So you answer a bunch of questions. We send it to OpenAI. It comes back with a personalized page. You display the personalized page with a form underneath it. And so it's it's now a form that's asking for your input based on based on prior input and it's personalized now to you. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of AI stuff that's coming in very soon. Are we building an AI AI based page builder and a decision tree builder? So you're just gonna ask a bunch of you just Tell us kind of like a few things what you were hoping to achieve. And it doesn't try for it to build it for you. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. It's it's 100 percent builds it for you automatically. At least your first draft, and then so you just you just editing bits and pieces rather than building. Okay, we'll put in a question, mate, because if, if we pivot here to look at systems that you use for acquisition, conversion, and retention, are you using Lead Talk yourself for your own business? Yes, yes, I am. Talk talk to me about. Let's let's drill into that in a bit, way. How are you okay, using yeah. these? All right. Okay. So most of the people who sign up to us actually come from recommendations. Yeah. So so they don't they don't uh, the entire business is built on recommendations. Right. We're starting our paid ads from next month is when we're starting our paid ads. And the reason why we took so long is because not so much I can't do marketing and just sign a whole bunch of people on. I have a responsibility to the existing users that we don't overgrow. And as a result, uh, degrade the performance of the platform. Um, because one of those things that I've learned is that there are problems of scale that don't show up un until you scale. And yes, you can do forecasting and you can do mock load uh, load testing and all kinds of stuff. Human beings just work really different to any automated thing out there. And what I found is that sometimes the performance will degrade. So as we've scaled slowly rather than quickly, which is what uh, mm -hmm. everybody wants to do, we've learned where the bottlenecks are. But we've learned bottlenecks because we're growing relatively slowly, in a relative sense, I should say. We're still growing reasonably quick, but but not like putting in 400x in one one year or something. Um, we, we're learning where the bottlenecks are from an infrastructure technology standpoint. So we're actually fixing those as we go. But now it's pretty robust. So I'm pretty confident now that if we sign on another, if we double the user base within one month, we'll be we'll be fine. We can handle the load. So th that was the main reason why I wasn't running paid ads or any of those measures because what you don't want is a system that starts giving 500 errors and then you destroy the existing customer base because yeah. they're spending ad dollars. Yeah, so yeah, always look after your existing customers is in my model and not just chase new ones at the expense of your existing ones. Yeah, that, that's just a stupid strategy. I think, just, yeah, yeah. I think it's a good, a good thing question to ask is like, what would happen? What would break, right? Yeah. If 100 yeah. people said yes to me today. Yeah, you know, exactly. Or whatever, whatever number is for you, right? So if you're used to bringing on five clients a month, what would happen if we were to suddenly double that, right? If you're used to bringing on a thousand clients a month, what would happen if, how could we bring on 10,000 in the next month? Correct. Right? Whatever the number is, make it something ridiculous that you'd go, I don't know how we'd possibly do that and answer that yeah. question. And I think that's a really good one to have. Yeah. And, and, that, and that essentially is, is what we said. So, so I told my dev team, I said, I said, what if we 10x our user base this year? And can you tell me what would happen? Or do we have any idea what would happen? Can we do a load test to do that? And, and so for that, and so we, we do do that, obviously. And then we identify where the bottlenecks are. And so anyway, so a lot of the platform has been rewritten like almost three, four times over now. And because, because of the inefficiencies that we found along the way. But never letting the performance degrade at the front end as in what the customer is experiencing. I'd rather turn off. In fact, there was a point in time when I turned off my, my sign-up page. You couldn't sign up to Leads of, for almost 18 months. And mm -hmm. I said, we've got no business getting an existing customer on board until we fix the issues that we that we have. None that was stopping any campaigns. But I know that if I just pile on more people, it, it will break. So let's go with the drawing board. Let's re-architect how we're doing things and fix mm -hmm. it up. So... Yeah, because it's a duty of care because they're spending money on paid ads. It's it's a big weight on your shoulders, so to speak. I never thought I'd feel like that, but I do. So, uh, but anyway, that's that's that. Now, Amazing. where are we using it? 
Yeah, so where we generally use it is, uh, I'll share with you a campaign. Uh, so I also sell a lot of courses. So I use those in on the courses side of things. So in the email sequences that people get along the way, like, hey, listen, if you're struggling with tracking, try this out. And so it actually profiles your current tracking and it gives you a metric on how much you could be saving if you fix your tracking. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I, I didn't quite prepare for that here, but if you want, I can quickly bring it up on my screen here. Hopefully, uh, let's see if I can bring that up. Anyway, we can keep talking while I bring that up in the in the background. Yeah. But that essentially, what it, like, it actually prints a dynamic generated sales data to sell you the course based on the yeah. input you give it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important thing, all right? It's, it's really getting very specific about answering our customers' questions. And if you think about marketing in general, let's put leads hook aside. If you're having a conversation with somebody that they're not with you on, you've lost them, right? And it's just yeah, absolutely. it's just a relationship thing, right? It's not it's not rocket science here. If your yeah, no, customer, yeah, or no, partner so, so is I've talking got, about one thing and you want to go somewhere right. else entirely, you're not on the no, same page. Yeah, so there are clients that are using it for cold prospecting. Usually, you get that email saying, "How would you like ten more leads this month or whatever?" Uh, can you? And and yeah, those are great. But then when, when you get when you see five thousand of those, you realize some guru taught that somewhere. Better off saying, "Hey, listen, we've got this new tool. It benchmarks you against your competitors. There's nothing." to buy from me just click the link and, right. uh, and profile yourself you can draw a radar diagram or a score or something you can say well typically people in your industry score 85 or above you scored a 43 that is probably a reason why you may be having issues with whatever a a b c whatever that is that you're struggling yeah. with and now you've opened a gap in their mind and here is a solution or you've done the setup to essentially a move into a, a conversation that they might want to have with you. You've got a reason for them to have a conversation with you now. And just by yeah, doing that well, is a fast slick away of doing cold prospecting. But guess what? As soon yeah. as they land on your page where they're going to get themselves their profile, their report, their whatever, you just fire off a GTM container. And now you've pixeled that person across every platform known to mankind. And you can set up your remarketing campaigns and all sorts of stuff on the, on the back end or let that outreach process build an audience for you. And now you've got a good audience to piggyback off to run paid ads with. And yeah, that is, and these people yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a cheap way to build an audience. I mean, a free way to build an audience, I guess. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, yeah just I'm, as a start example of, of what you can do. Yeah, I, I really like that. Nick. And certainly something that I got cottoned on to, I guess, very early on when I started using Lead Talk as well. And we built out a, a marketing diagnostic that we shared through, through LinkedIn primarily. Yeah. And I mean, I haven't touched that for a couple of years now, so it's probably well overdue for for an update and and certainly introducing some of the new tech that you've you've got and and uh, some of the AI tools that we can bring into it. But you know, essentially, it was the same thing. It says we've got this marketing diagnostic tool. You can take a look at it and find out where your own gaps are. Right? Where where do you have opportunities to improve? Whether or not that I'm the the one that's going to help you there, and the, certainly the feedback that I got from people who did use that quiz were like very much. I never thought of that. I never thought of that. I never thought of that. Just because they're just not in the space. But by asking things like, do you have a consistent brand presence across all of your customer touch points? Does, does your Facebook page have the same brand colors as your, your LinkedIn profile? Does everyone in your company use the same banner on yeah. their LinkedIn profile or not? You know, those so those, those little things I think are sort of super important. But if you're not aware of them, we can use things like Leads Hook as a tool there you go. to share it. Now, for this bit here, guys, you'll have to go and check out the you've got the YouTube channel as well. So make sure you subscribe to that while you're there. But, you know, what are your biggest lead gen wins hiding? Right? So, yeah, little kind of start here quiz. You know, I love this. And again, it's got like a quality of lead, your score in six elements, data segmentation, track analytics. You know, so, really cool so, little tool. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I've just shared an example just yeah. as a concept for, so people can visualize it. So, here yeah. you go. Where are your biggest uh, lead gen winners hiding in 20? There was a campaign we ran last year. And essentially that this entire thing is inside that's, that's built on lead took itself. And you click this, it draws a radar diagram, just like that one and tells where your weaknesses are. So can you imagine if you knew that for your client here, personalization is something they didn't do or tracking analytics sucked or whatever it was. Now you know exactly how to start the conversation with them, either on a phone call or an email or whatever it is that tells them to the, in fact, you're going to have an entire automation that, that only talks to people with weak personalization and all that. And so you can literally remove the salesperson right at the close and have pretty much 100% of the stuff happen just from this one thing. But because the scores also tell you the kind of issues that the industry is facing, and you could probably turn that into a, uh, a, a PR piece let's say a new survey with, with uh, 5,000 people has uncovered that really the quality of lead is the biggest problem in lead gen in 2024. And you can probably have a couple of journals pick up on that. So there's this, there's always thinking of the multiple layers in which I can use my data 
Obviously, most people only think of it as how can I use the data in my business? I'll stop sharing now. But they, there's as soon as you get hold of some data, there's always some way of slicing and dicing it in some other way. It could be a report you build for your existing customer base, could be a report you build for the people who are on your email list have never become your customers to induce them because obviously it's your lowest hanging fruit there. And thirdly, take that out and maybe come up with a PR campaign, bring some backlinks in and or share that, make a LinkedIn campaign out of it or something. You know, So, so I'm, I'm always thinking of what's the second order, third order, fourth order move that we can do from this one thing that we want to do. So as a result, awesome. any effort in, so any effort and energy you put into that one thing, you can you can kind of lever it four or five ways, which is which is the whole point of of doing all, yeah, is in like work once and extract value ten times over, right? That's that's the the name of the game here. Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna pivot. What we'll do is we'll put a link to that the YouTube video in the show notes so you can actually see what Nick was just sharing. Yeah, if you're listening to us right now, if you're watching on YouTube, obviously you will have seen it already. And we'll definitely put a link up to to Leeds Hook for you to go and check out some of the really cool things they're doing over there. We're going to start to wrap up though, Nick, and I want to know what's your biggest failure and what you learned from that experience? Oh, good question. My biggest failure was probably grossly underestimating how hard it is to get a SaaS software. <laughs> I was forecasting in three months, we'll be done, up and running. It almost took uh, two, two years. So so that's probably from a marketing standpoint, probably the my, my biggest failure. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah that, that, was, that, that was a big bomb. It's a ten years, There's one that I had back in the day where we were launching a canned meat product and we had had about 15 wins in a row. And, uh, and 15 wins gives you arrogance. So we're like, oh, now we got this. So we put, I don't know, <laughs> yeah, a couple hundred K in. You got it until you don't, right? And it, it bombed terribly. And when I analyzed why, what, what had happened, yeah, we had kind of, we kind of deluded ourselves into thinking we had the Midas touch. And so it's, it's yeah, that humble pie moment really. Every time I try to shortcut something, I get reminded of that. So I, I go back to the drawing board and say, you take a shortcut, mistakes. you will pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Or, or your odds of success dramatically get reduced because you don't get the, the little nuances that you do when you do when you do do the work, so to speak. So, so yeah. So the the how long it takes to get something off the ground is grossly underestimated by, uh, I guess, humanity. Everyone thinks they can, they're far better than what they are, or, or things are going to be far cheaper than what they actually are, or and far faster than what they actually are. So, so that is a lesson. If you yeah, if you don't have your buffers in place. And in fact, I, I was at an AWS meeting for startups, and it was astonishing that I was the only startup there that that was bootstrapped and profitable. Uh, everybody in the audience was just, how do I get my next round? And I remember talking to one of the founders there, and he said, I wish I could have done what you've done, uh, purely because by my third round, I've got hardly anything left. Because at some I've point, just you've actually given... got to make money, right? Correct. Yeah. Now, amazingly, amazingly- you actually have to sell something to There was very little- discussion around how to raise oh. how to acquire customers there was a lot of stuff about how do i get my how do i get funding it was yeah oh. a lot of funding type questions like how do i get someone to pay for this rather than hey can you just make a hack a prototype and see if this there's actually a market here and then come up with the next, next version the next version the next version granted at some yeah. point you do need funding if you're going to build a an ai machine then you, know, you, you you do need cash to do that but i, I was actually astonished and I'd know that people are funding ideas, like the like people out there writing a million dollar check for an idea and taking 30% of the business or whatever it is, which is gives you a valuation of 3 million. And I, I was just like, people actually do that? So, so yeah. <laughs> Where do I meet mean them? <laughs> I'm a startup who's got no experience in raising external capital because uh, I just said, let's go find a customer first and get them to fund the damn thing. You know, like that's how my brain works. Like, uh, well, it's I, not I, like, hey, let me go. I, I agree with you. At some point, your business has to sell a product to someone who you don't Correct. know. And that's the ultimate Correct. in the business test of value. It's not how much you write. Correct. Yeah. Right. You know, it's it's yeah, like, exactly. can, ultimately, it's, yeah. can I generate actual it's, profit uh, yeah, I, in the future? I remember a, a Gary Halbert seminar and this guy was going on about in a question in a Q&A about blah, blah, blah. And he just goes, just sell the damn thing, will you? And <laughs> it's so true. It's just, it just kind of takes, takes all the BS away. And and really, if you can't sell this to someone, then really you got no business uh, being here. Now I get it. There are some products out there that aren't in existence until you invest in technology. So I, I get it. That's a that's a good part of this space. Uh, but but there has to be some some way in which to sell this. So I, I remember this one guy. He made an app that calculates your carbon credits at, at checkout, and you can uh, donate uh, money towards uh, offsetting the carbon that is you consume to you know produce a T-shirt or something. And, mm -hmm. and I said, and he'd received like a million dollars for it or whatever it was to build it. And he was having a really hard time getting Shopify shop owners to, to, to sign up to it. And I was like, where's the money here? Like, 
maybe there's a small group of people out there that really care, you know, that much about carbon. I, I know from stats that a lot of people will support it, provided they don't have to pay for it. But if, the minute you have to pay for any social program, hey, no, 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 not me. Let the other block pay. That's usually what happens. Right. And so, so where's the value here? So I said to him, I said, why don't you just turn it around? Because all of these people are launching 50% off anyway. A any e comm store you go to, it's, you know, enter your email to get your coupon this and a coupon that. I said, why don't you tie in the coupon to, to, to this, that get 30% off and feel good about it? I said, that's going to be a far better value proposition because you're tying it into some monetary outcome. And so, yeah, I want to get a discount and save the planet, not pay for it to save the planet. And I said, that's yeah. far less friction. And so anyway, so long story short, that that idea about about how do I rethink of my offer is doesn't quite exist. And and I think a lot of them could probably turn their businesses around and not give so much equity away if they spent more time in the offer creation side of things so that they can get more traction faster, which means not to say you don't want to raise money, but you'd be raising money on better terms. Yeah, absolutely. Essentially. Yeah. And that's always a good thing, right? When we're doing that negotiation with investors, we want to do that. What's what's something about Leads Hook that you didn't expect? I didn't expect how non-technical people are. I'm fairly technical. I didn't realize I'm te I was technical, but obviously I am. I've got a maths degree and all that. And I don't mind getting into the into the weeds, so to speak. I thought everybody was like me until, <laughs> until we launched it. It's like, I don't know what, but a very, a very small percentage of the population enjoys that kind of like getting into it. Like I, this, I, I, this, I, this I, interesting I, intersect between marketing, technology, and data analytics that, you know. Yeah, correct. Uh, there was a bit of a, like, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, people don't really enjoy that part of it. So I was like, okay, right, point taken. So yeah, that, but my fault again, once again, arrogance right there. Like I should have researched, researched it. Should have uh, spent more time and effort. I, I think the reason why we didn't go down that path because it was going to cost a lot more to build that fruity, very user-friendly interface. So mm -hmm. I figured if I can get like like the nerdy types who are lots, spending lots of money, that's my wedge into the market. And and that exactly was what happened. We were able to get you know, a couple of thousand users of people who are fairly technical and spend big dollars. And generally, what you find is that that's the combination. Like the people who are spending a lot of money tend to be quite technical because that's what's needed to be able to scale that much. Or at least someone in their team is technical enough to, to be able to help them scale to that level is probably the better way to put it. Yeah, so now the next version of it, which is coming out very soon, it's much more just ask it and it builds the thing for you and everything's WYSIWYG and all that stuff. So it's ready now for the mass market, but we're leveraging off our existing customer base. I think if I'd gone the other way, then I would have just, just been another Me Too product and it probably would have never worked. And that's what I learned mm -hmm. from consumer branding is that you can't launch a Me Too product. Your, your odds of success with a Me Too product is basically zero. You might as well have not bothered with. Yeah. Someone else so, has the roadmap and you're going to fall into the potholes that they saw coming. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, good luck to for all the final hackers out there. But the point is you, you need some point of difference that is relevant to the market for you to you stand a chance. And that's that's like to go from 0% to like 1%, right? And then obviously a whole lot of extra work you got to do to get from 1% to 10%. Um, but but otherwise, you're zero. Like like Me Too products, I mean, there's dime a dozen. Uh, look at the number of Me Too products get get launched on AppSumo six months later. Sorry, we're shutting down. Yeah, they go. right. Exactly, because you, you can't just copy someone and have that. Uh, copy is not a strategy no, unless not one that's going to last. Not one's going to last right. very long. You need to, to copy and innovate. Two quick questions yeah. to finish up, Nick. What gives you motivation to keep going? I'm much more driven by winning. Oh. Yeah, I want to have the best product on the market. Competitive. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I'm not driven by money so much as, as driven by winning. So that's what probably drives me. The, the fact that we can see how our products are making a difference to people's lives. Like I was calculating a couple of months ago, like, okay, so this guy just spent a million dollars in ad spend and X million dollars worth of revenue is coming off that. So not just his revenue, but then the downstream customers that are buying his mortgage refi leads or whatever. And so end consumers that are obviously getting into products and services, all because some guy has spent a bit of money inside Leads Hook. And so that is probably the, the, my main driver is we can see that the value being created. And that's eff effectively, it's quite refreshing. I, I kind of enjoy that, that to see that it's, yeah, it's, it's always, so I used to do this like review, funnel reviews and, and I'd run into good funnels all the time. And then, but these times I tend to keep running into Leads Hook users. So I, so. I, I I can't share much anymore because I was like, oh, that's a great funnel, and I and I go behind the scenes like, oh shit, it's Leads Hook. <laughs> so I, I can't I can't give away I can't give away our clients' funnels, and that's one of the main reasons why we don't get testimonials. I've got really good friends who are using Leads Hook, and I tell them, hey, can you do you mind making me a testimonial? Only okay. only if I cover my face and and I don't mention my market. Yeah, literally, it's that, and it's, it's because awesome. yeah, I, there's no way I'm telling anybody this is what we're using. 
So right. anyway, to, long story short, that's the, that's the answer right there. Lastly, mate, who's someone you look up to in your field? Oh, in my field? It's okay. I, a team, of course. A team holds the number one place. Uh, number two, I guess I'm, I'm much more, I look up to some of our users mm. who do really, really crazy things with the product and, and just the appreciation of the grit and the tenacity and the perseverance to go build something. There are decision trees inside LeadZoop that look like the global aircraft map where there's like, like, it's like literally like 500 nodes. And if you think about it, someone dragged 500 nodes onto a page to build a user experience that is spending a million dollars a day in ad spend. That is, is absolutely astonishing. Like I'm pretty crazy with what I create. And sometimes I look at what they do and, and you're almost like, you know, is this a human that's doing this? Because it's, mm. it's mind boggling complexity. It's so complex that when they send support tickets, we like do rock, paper, scissors, like who's going to handle this one? Because there's just stuff going all over the place mm. and, you, and, and to try and break it down as to where. So I, I would say what inspires me is, is the craziness that some of our users do. And yeah, it just makes me go like, like I'm not pushing as hard as I probably could. So let's, let's go. That's, that's probably... Yeah, the most inspiring thing I see on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is the crazy stuff that that users actually end up doing. Um, yeah, I love that. I think the product, yeah, it's like the... like a use case that is well beyond intended use case. <laughs> sort of thing. you know, like use this product for this, and they kind of like it's, it's like a MacGyver thing. Like you, you thought your Swiss Army knife was going to be used to cut a rope, and someone is yeah. I don't know, someone makes an aircraft with it, and you're like, oh, hang on a second, <laughs> this is not this is not how it's supposed to work, or we didn't think it was supposed to work this way. Yeah, we've got people who, are, who have made no-code apps that's, inside that's LinkedIn. That's such an inspiring thing there when you see what other people can do with the tools that you've created for them. I know how and it's, and it's well outside of what you thought. Like, I mean, I'm pretty wild with my imagination. Like, oh, you could use it for this. And you see like, whoa, hang on a second. Where did that come from? <laughs> that's a way, way off base. So yeah. that's that's really, really inspiring. It, it makes me want to keep pushing. And so I often get in touch with them saying, hey, listen, you got this craziness going on here. What difficulties did you face? How could we have made this process simpler, faster, and easier for you. And then we kind of go back and take that, if that feedback yeah, back into product development. I'm sure I imagine a 500 node in the funnel there. I think my biggest yeah. one's maybe got 70 in it. Even that was like... Yeah, yeah exactly. Like it's it's when someone's running into someone and they, they think they're like a big dog and yeah. they're like, oh, oh, we spend a million dollars a month. It's like, oh, what does your biggest user do? I said, oh, we got a guy who does a million dollars a day. He's like, oh, what? Really? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, don't ever think you're big because there's always, a, there's always another always one around big. the corner. <laughs> <There's always> someone... <laughs> yeah exactly just play your game make sure your roi is there and and stay yeah just focus on your thing don't let it get to your head that you're spending so much because at some point there's always going to be someone who eats you up or or there's always a bigger guy around the corner yeah absolutely nick i love that i really appreciate you jumping on the podcast today and sharing so much oh. of your experience and uh, some of the use cases for leads hook and using quiz funnels in your business if you haven't got one well Think about what you could do with it, right? Can you qualify clients? Because you, as you said, what are the other things that you can do that you can collect data from and provide value to your customers at the, at the same time as you are asking them questions, which let's be real, you probably should be asking them anyway. Yeah. What we'll do guys, and again, Nick, thanks for jumping on. Um, we'll no do, Thank you see all the details in the show notes, including a link over to Lead Talk. You can go and check that out. That's got some awesome case studies on the website as well. And looking forward to the new version, which is going to be much more user-friendly. That it will be. Right. And thanks, thanks, guys. Thank you. And some of the AI stuff that you're introducing into it, mate. So thanks for coming on today. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye. Hey, guys. And uh, thanks again for joining us on More Clients, Less Effort. We've got another exciting episode coming up next week to give you a ton of value. If you hit the three dots at the top of your phone, like, subscribe, follow, share it with someone who you think might get value from the conversations we're having each and every week on the show. We look forward to catching you real soon. Yeah.